understanding procrastination. So what is it? Why do we do it? And how can we overcome it? So I'd like to point out that this body of literature is very extensive. So today will be uh, somewhat of an overview and an introduction to procrastination. So I've set aside some future seminars uh, so that we can dive deeper into the procrastination literature um, so we can explore it together at a later date at a deeper level. Remember, guys, please feel free to either send me DMs with your questions if you are going to watch the recording or leave your questions in the VC channel. We'll get to them at the end of, of the seminar today. So let's begin. Let's start to travel down this rabbit hole of procrastination. Um, we all put things off from time to time, but procrastinators tend to show uh, a high level of propensity to chronically avoid certain tasks and often deliberately look for distractions to take them away from the tasks that they don't want to do. So I'd like to emphasize uh, a key phrase in that last sentence, and that is chronic avoidance, essentially. Procrastination can become a chronic and a pathological condition. It's a serious psychological and ideological phenomena that must be taken seriously. So let's take a quick look at the prevalent statistics for procrastination uh, among the population. So it's widely prevalent. Uh, research shows that approximately 20% of the adult population, around 50% of the teenage to student population, procrastinate in a consistent and problematic manner. Uh, essentially what that means, they're they experience significant difficulties in their everyday life as a result of procrastination. So additionally, the number of people who procrastinate in general uh, tends to be even higher. So for example, although approx approximately 50% of, say, college students, for example, consider themselves to be chronic procrastinators, around 75% of students uh, consider themselves to be procrastinators in general, not just with their studies. And then furthermore, even another 80 to 95% of those same students say that they engage in procrastination to some degree uh, outside of their study, outside of their work, in their personal life. So it's, it permeates through every major facet of our lives, essentially. This also demonstrates the fact that even although procrastination is quite prevalent in general, there are certain populations where it is especially common. Um, it's commonplace with students, as we found, um, that the tendency to procrastinate on tasks right until for the due date of an assessment piece, for an example. Um, it's actually so prevalent that it actually has its own syndrome. It's called the student procrastination syndrome. Um, finally, please take note that there are some indications that the rate of procrastination in the population is actually increasing. So it's not getting better, it's actually getting worse. And that's consistent with the growing prevalence of similar issues that are linked to pro procrastination, such as overeating, gambling. Um, poor delay of gratification, and all this is built around people's inability or failure to self-regulate themselves, essentially. So before we go too much further into the research, we should formally define the term first so we can all be on the same page. So I'm just going to post the first little infographic for this week. So check out the uh, the voice chat. I'll just throw it up now. It's essentially a tongue and cheek play at, at the definition of procrastination. So take a look at that as, as I'm moving through the more formal ones. So I've gone through the scientific literature and I've looked for consensus on these definitions. So here's essentially the three main ones. So it has been referred to as the action of delaying or postponing something. Another definition suggests that procrastination is a deliberate intention to habitually put something off. And lastly, the third one that kind of crept up a lot in the literature was um, 
the definition of procrastination being an act of unnecessarily postponing decisions or actions. So based off those three broad definitions, we can now start to uh, narrow down and talk more about the actual specifics of procrastination. So it tends to occur as, as a result of a person's uh, inability to self-regulate their behavior and thoughts. It is uh, commonly associated with the term acrasia, which is the state of mind where a person acts against their better judgment due to a distinct lack of self-control. Uh, what makes procrastination even more of a complex condition is that it is generally based on irrationality. Uh, in other words, uh, the person understands that procrastinating is bad for them. They get that. They see it as a negative behavior. And even when they want to stop, they simply can't, particularly if it's embedded and ingrained and they've been doing it for a long time. So from a more of a psychological standpoint, one of the main factors behind procrastination is the way a person prioritizes their short-term mood and emotion states, and they prioritize them over the long-term achievements and their overall well-being, essentially. So in past seminars, we've spoken about the personality trait delay of gratification, for example. Uh, essentially, that is the ability for a person to withhold short-term, small gains, knowing that they trade them off because in the long term, they're going to get uh, larger gains, essentially. It seems to be the case that the relationship might exist here between people with low delay of gratification and procrastination. So here's another example. When procrastinators are averse to a task due to either, say, let's uh, call it anxiety or low self-efficacy or they're simply bored and they don't want to do the task because it's going to kind of create even more boredom, they postpone it. They do this in order to avoid suffering from negative emotions in the present. So what makes this more convoluted is that they do this despite the fact that this delay will prevent them from progressing and achieving their stated goal. And on top of that, despite the fact, again, that it could cause them to experience more negative emotions in the long term. So this is where the individual begins to also feel guilty about their procrastination. And hence, the snowball effect of those negative emotions begin to cascade. And we see that uh, cyclical effect. So let me. Um, Pause for a moment again and bring up the next uh, infographic. So this is what I refer to as the uh, procrastination cycle, uh, and that should be up in the voice chat now for you to have a quick look at. So in addition to this, people often fall into the trap of procrastination because they have the difficulty connecting or realizing their future self, and they find it difficult aligning themselves with their future goals. And furthermore, into the future, the person has to analyze their goals, uh, the stronger the feelings of procrastination become. That's what we've found anyway. In these types of situations, the person feels as though any positive or negative outcomes for that matter that they will experience in the future will be experienced by someone else, aka their future self. So they disconnect. Or they kind of convince themselves that. Um, those negative feelings, they won't occur in the future. It'll be all right. I'll sort it out. Even when they know deep down uh, that they're kind of fooling themselves and the reality is that that's just not the case. They're likely to suffer the negative emotions in the, in the present and in the future uh, if they're procrastinating. So there's a couple of other personal and background factors that are linked and associated. Uh, with the likelihood that a person will be predisposed to procrastination. So firstly, we can look at some of the demographic factors. So for example, there was a, a, a recent meta-analysis of studies on procrastination that showed a person's age is negatively associated with the likelihood that they will procrastinate, since people tend to procrastinate less as they grow older. And that's interesting because we see conscientiousness rise as people get older as well. So there's an interesting link there. So sometimes it goes in the good, a good direction 
and then another in and other times it can it can go in a in a in a bad correlation um, in some instances. Uh, some more demographics. So this meta-analysis also showed um, that women tend to procrastinate less on average than men. Uh, also, um, a person's nationality, education level, marital status, um, there's interesting links there in those demographics with uh, procrastinating as well. Um, some of these seem to be more uh, causal in nature, meaning that they uh, can make a person more likely to procrastinate, while others are more uh, correlational in nature, meaning that they're associated with higher levels, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the person's going to procrastinate more. It just means that there's a disposition present and they have to be careful. Overall, um, while these factors are all associated with procrastination in some, to some extent, it's important to note that procrastination can be found across every population, and that's why it's viewed as a universal human behavior. And it also suggests why it's so pervasive, essentially, across all our different cultures. And this segues nicely into my next section, which is where we start to link personality traits that contribute to procrastination. So there is some interesting research out there that shows that there is a significant relationship between some of the personality traits uh, that we have and people's tendency to procrastinate. So I've, I've found a couple of the most common ones and the most prevalent ones. So the first one's conscientiousness. So people who are high in conscientiousness tend to procrastinate less because they know that it's a negative affecting trait and it's going to hinder their progression. Because people high in conscientiousness tend to be uh, disciplined, they're achievement orientated, they tend to be focused, hardworking, uh, and quite organized as well. So all those different traits, sub-traits that come under conscientiousness, they all act as a, as a force field, essentially, to procrastination. Uh, conversely, the less conscientious an individual is, the more likely they are to procrastinate. That's the other side of it. Uh, impulsivity is another one. So this is the tendency to act without planning or without considering the consequences of one's actions. It's strongly associated with procrastination. The more impulsive someone is, the more likely they are to procrastinate. So there's that. Uh, trade agreeableness is another one. The tendency to care about others and work well with them is a personality trait associated with procrastination in some cases as well. And Specifically in situations where people who are low in agreeableness, they tend to procrastinate as a form of rebellion against tasks or deadlines given to them by authority figures, essentially. Especially authority figures that they don't particularly like or resent, like a boss or something like that, that you might not uh, like too much, let's say. Uh, Sensation seeking is another interesting. Uh, trait that is linked with um, the tendency to procrastinate, uh, particularly in situations where people procrastinate in order to make tasks feel more challenging and exciting. Usually, this happens by waiting right until the deadline to get them done. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this uh, seminar because that's those people who are sensation seeking, they tend to tap into their stress levels, their epinephrine. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And lastly, another big one is uh, trait neuroticism. The tendency to be prone to negative emotions such as stress, uh, anxiety, depression. Um, so meaning that on average, neurotic people are more likely uh, to procrastinate in some situations. Um, they tend to be more likely to suffer from negative emotions rather than anxiety and depression, um, especially if they are procrastinating or as a result of their procrastination. There have been some interesting findings where a person's neuroticism could be one of the causes of their procrastination. So, uh, for example, when they are so anxious 
about making uh, or failing in the task that they're looking at doing, they end up avoiding the whole task completely to begin with. So they're kind of the big ones that appear in the literature. Um, I've got a couple of others as well that you might be interested in. So these are some correlations and some kind of non-correlations, so to speak. So a couple of things I picked up researching for this. Cognitive ability and procrastination. So to date, we actually have no significant correlations to report uh, linkages between a person's overall intelligence and procrastination. We, we don't have anything there to suggest that at the moment. So I guess that's a good thing. Uh, ADHD and procrastination. So we found that the higher the ADHD level or the higher the ADHD score, the higher the likelihood of that person procrastinating. So the reason why there's links there is because uh, with those that suffer from ADHD, there's that ongoing battle with difficulty to maintain focus and attention while working, and also the tendency to be easily distracted as well. So there's your linkages there with with your attention deficit disorders and, and procrastination. Uh, genetics and procrastination. So there actually does appear to be a genetic contribution to procrastination. So uh, the correlation is moderate. Um, so it's something that needs to be definitely considered. So if your parents were procrastinators, it's likely that you've picked up a distribution or a predisposition for that as well. Um, and a lot of these links uh, back to personality traits that we've previously spoken about. So we know that personality does carry a genetic load. It's roughly around uh, 40 to 50%, depending on the traits that we have. Um, those embedded in conscientiousness, neuroticism, agreeableness, agreeableness etc. So there are some genetic contributions as well that need to be considered. If we go to environmental factors, and procrastination there's some interesting links there as well sleep schedule timing of shifts at work not fitting in at work um, competing cultures uh, mismatch of their skills and experience these can all be triggers for procrastination and avoidance of of um, completing tasks so uh, in an environment where your workplace is kind of cluttered with distractions or your workspace at home, for example. Um, if you're not very good at setting goals, so poorly defined goals, or a lack of any goal setting, setting strategy at all could be a potential problem. Uh, lack of motivation or the boredom that you get from tasks can be a trigger. Uh, a lack of energy, so again, poor sleep, bad nutrition, lack of exercise. It could be some sort of vitamin or mineral deficiency. Um, they all can potentially um, bring on procrastination or increase the likelihood of, of procrastination. Uh, fear or failure of receiving negative feedback. Not many people like that, so that can be a trigger. And perceived lack of control or locus control. So your inability to see that you've got the skills in order to finish the task so you avoid it. Um, so any kind of situation like that can trigger uh, procrastination as well. So as you can see, going through that list, there's quite an extensive range of factors there or reasons. The good thing is most of them are under our control. Um, but nonetheless, these things may cause a person to procrastinate. At this point, it might be prudent to actually spend a, a few moments speaking about how people cope with their procrastination when it's actually occurring. This is where we can start to delve more into the neuroscience and the psychology of, of procrastination. So just quickly, here are some other ways <clears throat> that I'd like to mention as well. So we've spoken about things like avoidance, denial of the procrastination, or uh, a justification of it. Um, some other things that are quite common as well is valorization, which is an interesting one. So this is where people kind of take pride or pretend to take pride in how much they procrastinate. So they're essentially using humor to mask the negative effects. Uh, I see that happening a lot. 
Wishful thinking is another one. So this is where the individual focuses on what they wish they could accomplish rather than actually just getting in there and getting it done. Um, rumination is another one. So fixating on your mistakes constantly and thinking about how you procrastinate. Again, rather than getting the thing done. Uh, trivialization is another uh, psychological concept here as well. So pretending that the tasks you postpone aren't that important. So it's like an irrational justification that's all combined in there. So you might be thinking, okay, there's a litany of, of factors here which could be causing um, someone to procrastinate, right? So how can you tell if you're procrastinating or how can you tell if you load onto it? So we have a few simple scales uh, that various psychologists have developed over the years. Uh, one real easy one to administer is the one based off the GPS, which is known as the General Procrastination Scale. So essentially there's five questions and you ask yourself these questions. How characteristic is this behavior for me? And obviously you answer intuitively, you, you answer them as honestly as you can, be authentic with yourself, and also try not to overthink. So what I'm going to do is actually copy and paste the five questions into the chat. <clears throat> so these are the questions based off the GPS, the general procrastination scale. The first one is asking yourself, do I often find myself performing tasks that I had intended to do days before? Second question, I do not do assignments until just before they are to be handed in. So this can include tasks at work as well. Question three, even with jobs that require little else except sitting down and doing them, I find they seldom get done for days. Question four, in preparing for some deadline, I often waste time by doing other things. Question five, I am continually saying I'll do it tomorrow. So these five questions have been uh, rigorously tested. Um, they have pretty good alpha levels, which is a good thing from a, from a statistician standpoint. Um, and if you answer yes to all those questions, uh, like a few people are mentioning here in the chat, then I guess this seminar is a good place for you to be at the moment. Um, so we can try help you out here. So essentially with these five questions, the more characteristic these Sorry, my headphones turned off. So with these five questions, uh, the more characteristic these behaviors are of you, the more likely it is essentially that you may have a slight problem with procrastination. And the more you kind of answer yes to, I'm guessing there's a few of you in here that, yeah, like I was saying, you're in the right place. So let's table that for now. And we'll, and we'll move on to the rest of the, the seminar. We'll get back to that. So now we move into the section where we start to talk about mitigating procrastination, how to stop doing it. So, so far, we saw that uh, we kind of know what procrastination is. We know why people do it. We know a lot of the factors that can cause it. And we know how to tell whether or not it's an issue for you. So we've covered a fair bit of territory at this point. However, the good thing is that there is also a lot of research on this topic that shows us how it is possible to beat procrastination. It is possible to bring it down. It is possible to mitigate and reduce your tendency to procrastinate. So <clears throat> there's essentially three steps. I tried to make this as, as simple as possible, essentially. So it's about setting goals, clear goals for yourself. It's about assessing the nature of your procrastination problem. And then it's about implementing a plan of action, which relies on a couple of different cognitive and behavioral anti-procrastination techniques. So the first step is setting clear objectives and goals. This is important because doing this helps you to figure out 
what you're exactly trying to accomplish. And because you are more likely to pursue goals that are clearly defined than those that are vague or abstract, this is a great place to start. So this also means that you need to kind of sort yourself out and start to figure out, preferably writing this stuff down, what you want to accomplish in as much detail as possible. For example, a goal such as uh, I need to finish my PhD and, and, and finish writing up my thesis. It's kind of vague. It's kind of broad. It's not very specific. And in situations like that, the likelihood of procrastination is, is, is likely to increase if you're that way inclined. However, if you were to rewrite that goal and say something along the lines of, okay, every day I'm going to write 500 words, no matter what. Doesn't matter if the words aren't great, doesn't really matter about paragraph structure or anything like that. Let's just get the 500 words down and then we'll start to create our first draft. So setting a number and a target is a lot more specific. So what I'm trying to get you guys to think about here is to get your goal setting theory to align with the SMART structure. So let me throw up the next infographic. Here we go. So what you're looking at here is a SMART structure. So in goal setting theory, this method is used a lot and I'm sure we've all seen it before. You have to make sure that when you're setting goals, they're specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant and they're time bound. And there's a lot of literature behind this that reinforces just how great this model is. It's also simple to understand and easy to get behind as well. It's great. So in previous seminars, I've actually spoken about the importance of goal setting theory and how it takes a bit of practice to set solid goals. Because if you make them too easy, then you're likely to be overcome with boredom. The challenge just isn't there, right? Conversely, if you make them too difficult, then you're likely to stop as they appear too difficult to obtain and you kind of lose the fire. So finding that nice balance of difficulty and goal setting is vital for mitigating procrastination and it's important for, for setting up goals that are actually achievable. So once you have your SMART goals in place, the second step is to then assess your procrastination problem, then employ some methods to fix it. So once you've clearly defined your goals, you assess the nature of your problem. Where is this procrastination coming from? Because based on what we've been talking about previously, it can come in many different directions, right? So this means you need to look at the way you act. And once you figure out when and how and why you procrastinate, you need to analyze your behavior then in order to determine why you do it as well. So for example, you might notice during the weekend, um, let's say, even though you want to be productive, you end up sitting in front of the computer, uh, wasting hours browsing social media and playing games. Instead of getting things done, maybe you justify it because you feel like your week was long and you're overwhelmed with all the tasks you have to do. And maybe it's a case of you're not sure where to get started. This is important because procrastination is varied, right? It's, it's complex phenomena. So generalized solutions are often to going to be less effective than the personalized, structured, and specific ones that we looked at in our first task, setting up our SMART goals, right? So there's a really great resource, um, uh, solvingprocrastination.com. And then there's a link there for why people procrastinate. I think I, uh, I'd really recommend this for everyone to go to that website, solvingprocrastination.com, go to the, the paper that's titled Why We Procrastinate. I've covered the essentials, I guess, this week, but it goes a little bit more into depth. Um, and take the time to go through these readings as they're very helpful. Okay, the third step and the last step is to create an action plan. So once you've set your goals, once you've assessed the nature, it's time to create a plan of action and figure out which techniques you can use in order to try and mitigate 
yourself from procrastinating. So there are actually quite a few anti-procrastination techniques out there that you can use. And I've trawled through the literature for you again, and I've kind of synthesized them all into a nice little list here for you. So here's a few ideas. Break large goals into small actionable tasks. Uh, set self-imposed deadlines for competing, uh, completing tasks. Tailor your schedule to your daily productivity cycles. Establish a consistent work routine. If possible, gamify your behavior and create productivity streaks. If it possible, remove as many of the distractions as possible from your work environment. Use things like nudges that make it easier for you to get started um, and, and on that pathway of getting tasks done. Get into work mode by starting with a tiny step first rather than a big step. And we've spoken about that before with uh, examples in improving conscientiousness, for example, like getting up, making your bed, tidying your room. Small steps first, and then they turn into larger steps later. Reward yourself for progress. So at your incremental milestones, have a, have a milestone. Buy yourself a board ape. <laughs> Strategically switch between tasks when necessary. Uh, a couple of others. Limit the time available for decision making because, again, that is what some of the common problems with procrastination. We spend too long going around in circles. Deal directly with irrational fears regarding your performance. So be authentic and be upfront with yourself. Um, don't sugarcoat it. Furthermore, so you can use a, a variety of these techniques in order to get yourself started. And a large number of those I've, I've listed, uh, the common ones that, are, that is. Um, and again, if you want to read more, on the Solving Procrastination website, there's another article that's titled How to Stop Procrastinating. So if you want to look more into that, another great resource there. I mentioned this before, but I want to say it again. When implementing this approach for dealing with procrastination, there's a massive benefit from writing everything down, including the clearly defined goals, including your insights, including how you've picked up on why you're procrastinating and your preferred techniques for dealing with them. Get them all down in a document. It'll take a bit more work than just keeping all the information in your head but it will pay off in the long term because it will improve your ability to analyze the situation and keep track of things while also increasing your commitment to the course of action. So all of which will increase the likelihood that you'll be successful. So in summary, understanding the source of procrastination is the key here. This is not easy as we found as the sources of procrastination tend to come from more than one place. Thus, it's, it's difficulty and its complexity. There are different types of procrastinators as well, as we found in today's sem uh, seminar. We've spoken about a couple of different ones. Here's another example. There's the kind of procrastinator that actually enjoys the stress of the impending deadline. It's not, it's, it's, it's the only way they can kind of get themselves into action. They like the feeling of something being due in an hour and how it gets them up. It gets them activated, it gets them sharp, it gets them focused, and it makes them feel something. So in these situations, these types of people are essentially tapping into their epinephrine system, the stress system, right? And for which stress really tightens their ability to see, to focus, to perceive, and it creates action elements within their body that gets them to move. Essentially what these people are doing, these types of procrastinators, they're leveraging their internal stress in order to achieve a certain state that they can't seem to access in other ways. If you're like this, I strongly encourage you to uh, start thinking about other ways in which you can get yourself into action because constantly triggering your epinephrine system is not a good way to you know orientate your life it's 
it takes too much stress on the central nervous system and it uses a lot of resources and it's just counterintuitive to uh, motivation systems, positive motivation systems. Uh, a lot of people use caffeine as a motivator as well, right? And look, caffeine is okay. And I just want to emphasize it's just okay. It's not great. Um, it's readily available. It's accessible. It's cheap. It's not illegal. But it only really provides a short temporal period of motivation. Um, it may force someone out of their procrastination, but only for a very short period of time. So research shows that caffeine, it does release dopamine, but only at low levels. Um, it seems to be the case that the links between caffeine and parts of the brain, it seems to increase neuron firing in a particular region of the brain, and that is the nucleus accumbens. And it seems to increase neuron firing of about 30% which is reasonable but it's not great there are a much there's a ton of other things that can get a a better, a better hit a better percentage um so for those that aren't aware the nucleus accumbens it's a region of the brain that's responsible for motivation and action so i've got a picture here which shows you the region of the brain that i'm talking about so where that little red dot is there medial like so that's the where the nucleus incumbent sits essentially um, and it acts as a neural interface for the reward systems and it plays a key role in things like feeding stress related activities and behavior essentially um, substances like caffeine like i was talking about before seem to hit that area pretty pretty quickly and yes, you will get the, the short-term motivation, but it's really a Band-Aid fix, not to mention the downer that you get after the caffeine highs. So there's much better things you can be doing um, to, fix, to fix things uh, in your positive motivational states. And what I'm going to do is uh, I've been talking now for about 40 minutes. I think that's enough. Um, so now let's let's hand it over to you guys let's let's take some questions so give me a second first to um scroll through the chat just to see if there's any that i missed you find that it's more like an on off switch are oh, those questions, the five questions that we were talking about before. So Slightly Deceptive has mentioned that um, they're either super productive once they get into the rhythm and start knocking out tasks, or the other way is putting it off for weeks. Yeah, and that's where I was talking about before. If you're finding it difficult to start something, take a little step first. Something that may look like a massive problem or something that's going to take a long time to do. Also, break it down into smaller pieces so it doesn't look as enormous. And you'd be surprised at how quickly you can trick your brain into actually getting started. So start small, and then as you start to build up steam, then your, your natural dopamine and endorphins start to kick in. Then your motivation becomes... Uh, a lot more prevalent and that driving force keeps you going so that's the thing with procrastination for a lot of people once they start they tend to be okay it's just getting started is is the big problem all right let me go to stage jira is, is there anyone with their hand up does anyone want to step up and ask a question No one's got any questions. Maybe I'm being too thorough here. Maybe I should leave all this more open-ended. Okay, I see there's a few people typing, so we might have some questions coming through.
Interesting question. Do you believe if someone says their body can't produce dopamine? Um, there have been some very rare cases um, where there's a, ge a, a genetic kind of disposition where a, an individual finds it extremely difficult to produce dopamine. There's a lot of cases where p people have abused substances like methamphetamine, for example, and it's cooked parts of their brain that restricts them from um, firing off those neurotransmitters for dopamine as well. I, press, I procrastinate even to sleep. Yeah, that's super common. Super common. Yep. Setting goals is one thing, but how do we make ourselves stick to them? So sometimes you find yourself not taking them too seriously. Usually, in situ I don't know all your circumstances, but whenever I've had people come to the clinic and ask me questions about that, usually their goal-setting strategy is off. Usually they start to wane because either... They haven't found the sweet spot with their goal setting, so either it was too easy or too difficult, or the end goal that they have doesn't actually interest them, um, so they lose passion for it. Purple. Sometimes I feel like I can't sleep even when I'm tired. This is off topic. Uh, <laughs> I do have a seminar coming up that's going to be completely dedicated to sleep. Um, maybe we should wait for that one. Uh, linking back to that question, do you believe if someone says their body can't produce dopamine? If so, is there anything someone can do to make it better? Um, it depends on the condition that they're in in the first place. Um, so, for example, with the substance abuse example I was talking about before, if those pathways are damaged and destroyed or atrophied, um, then it's very, very unlikely that they'll be able to salvage that and get it back. So there's actually been some interesting um, studies that show uh, functional MRI scans and also a combination of EEG scans as well uh, are from people who have been like long-time meth addicts, for example. Um, and you can actually see parts of the brain that have been completely eroded, a.k.a. cooked, like it's just burnt through regions of the brain. Um, and depending on where the particular chemical attaches itself, well, obviously, the outcomes could be very, diff uh, very different. So usually it tends to be pre prefrontal stuff with those types of substances where it damages um, critical thinking skills and um, execution of personality in some instances, which is why uh, a lot of people with substance abuse, like chronic substance abuse, tend to be very irritable and, and short-tempered and things like that. Generally, illegal substances. We have seen it in, uh, in lesser forms, but we still have seen it with um, excessive... Um, weed, uh, marijuana use and stuff as well. Particularly the motivation centers of the brain. Uh, we see a lot of people just completely destroy their, their motivational. So their, uh, their accumbens, for example, what that region of the brain I was talking about before, the nucleus accumbens, which is responsible for a lot of drive and motivation and activation of things. And it's linked with behavior as well, that can get cooked.
Yeah, I did say weed. Oh, yeah, man. Weed is no joke. Yeah. We're only just starting to find out the long-term effects now as it's become legal and we've been able to pass studies through ethics committees and things like that so we can figure out what the heck's going on with it. But it depends on, on the strand and, you know, the chemicals that we use to grow it. There's a, there's a lot of variables involved with it. Yeah, as you miss the whole lot, mate, you're going to have to watch, you're going to have to listen to the recording. Do we have any other questions or should I hit stop on the recording? Jazz, did you get the, the hair ping from uh, – I made an announcement in team announcements. I made two of them. Did you get that ping? Maybe it's not working. I'm, I might try on everyone to see if that works, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to get rugged by the bot. Let me stop the recording.